Motivation is fundamental to our daily life. It's what allows us to get out of bed in the morning. It's what allows us to pursue long-term goals or short-term goals. Motivation and the chemistry of motivation is tightly wound in with the neurochemistry of movement. In fact, the same single molecule, dopamine, is responsible for our sense of motivation and for movement. Even though nerves controlling muscles, so again, these are nerves in the spinal cord or brain that move our limbs, the effector chemical there, the one that actually causes the muscles to twitch, to contract, is acetylcholine. In the brain, acetylcholine is responsible for focus. However, whether or not we move, whether or not we want to move, whether or not we have the desire to overcome barriers of, you know, they could be social barriers or financial barriers or time constraints, that depends on this molecule we call dopamine. It's a fascinating molecule and it lies at the center of so many great things in life. And it lies at the center of so many terrible aspects of life, namely addiction and certain forms of mental disease. So if ever there was a double-edged blade in the world of neuroscience, it's dopamine. There's a fundamental relationship between dopamine released in your brain and your desire to exert effort. And you can actually control the schedule of dopamine release, but it requires the appropriate knowledge. This is one of those cases where understanding the way the dopamine system works will allow you to leverage it to your benefit. And if you don't understand the way the dopamine works, there's a good chance that it's going to pull you out into the current of life, meaning the rest of the world is going to control your dopamine schedules. Motivation is a two-part process, which is about balancing pleasure and pain, okay? Most people think about motivation and reward and dopamine as just trying to achieve pleasure. It's fair to say that dopamine is responsible for wanting and for craving, and that's distinctly different from the way that you hear it talked about normally, which is that it's involved in pleasure. So yes, dopamine is released in response to sex. It's released in response to food. It's released in response to a lot of things, but it's mostly released in anticipation and craving for a particular thing. Let's say you're hungry, or you're looking forward to a cup of coffee, or you're going to see your partner. Well, your dopamine neurons are firing at a low rate until you start thinking about the thing that you want or the thing that you're looking forward to. Just thinking about food, about sex, about nicotine if you like nicotine, or cocaine or amphetamine, can increase the amount of dopamine that's released to the same degree as actually consuming the drug. Now it depends, in some cases, for instance, the cocaine user, the addict that wants cocaine, can't just think about cocaine and increase the amount of, that's released about a thousand fold, it's actually much lower. But it's just enough to put them on the motivation track for to crave that particular thing. Now there are reasons why you would have brain circuitry like this. I mean, brain circuitry like this didn't evolve to get you addicted. Brain circuitry like this evolved in order to motivate behaviors toward particular goals. Water when you're thirsty, sex in order to reproduce. Now nowadays there's a ton of interest in social media and in video games. And it, there have been some measurements of the amount of dopamine released. Video games, especially video games that have a very high update speed where there's novel territory all the time, no novelty is a big stimulus of dopamine. Those can release dopamine somewhere between nicotine and cocaine. So very high levels of dopamine release. Social media is an interesting one because the amount of dopamine that's released in response to logging onto social media initially could be quite high, but it seems like likely that there's a taper in the amount of dopamine but and yet people still get addicted. If there's something that you're pursuing in life, whether or not it's an academic goal or a financial goal or a relationship goal, one of the things that you can do to ensure that you will remain on the path to that goal for a very long time and that you will continue to exceed your previous performance as well as continue to enjoy the dopamine release that occurs when you hit the milestones that you want to achieve is to occasionally remove reward subjectively. Let's say you set out a goal of making, I'm going to make this quantitative with respect to finances because it just is an easy description, but this could also be in sport, this could be in school, this could be in music, could be in anything, creative endeavors. But let's say you set out a certain financial goal, or let's say you want to get a certain number of followers on whatever social media platform. As you reach each one of those goals, you should know now that the amount of dopamine is not going to peak, it's actually going to diminish and make you crave more. The key to avoiding that crash 
but to still keep it in healthy levels that will allow you to continue your pursuit is as you are staircasing toward your goal. Maybe that's dollars, maybe that's followers, maybe that's grades, maybe that's some other metric, it's medals or trophies. You actually want to blunt the reward response for some of those intermediate goals. Now, I'm not telling you you shouldn't celebrate your wins, but I'm telling you not to celebrate all of them. Or as a good friend of mine who uh, recently, uh, fortunately for him, uh, had a great financial success, he asked me and somebody else, a, a good friend of mine who's very tuned into dopamine reward schedules, understands how they work at a really deep level. And he said, I don't know what to do next. And we said, oh, well, that's simple. You should just give most of it away. And this wasn't a ploy to receive any of the money ourselves. This was really about reducing the impact of that reward. Now, hopefully giving him money away, if you already have enough of it, would be something that was rewarding in and of itself. But if you're a student who's pursuing goals in university, or you're an athlete who's pursuing goals, it actually makes sense from a rational perspective, once you understand these mechanisms, to hit a new high point of performance, or to get that A+, plus, or for you if it's an A-, minus, etc., and to tell yourself, okay, that was good, but to actually actively blunt the reward, to not go and celebrate too intensely. Because in doing that, you keep your dopamine system in check and you ensure that you're going to stay on the path of continued pursuit, not just for that thing, but for all things. Big increases in dopamine lead to big crashes in dopamine and big increases in dopamine up the ante. They increase the extent to which you are willing to invest time and energy in order to achieve goals and rewards that may be out of your reach. You never really know if you're going to succeed. So to make this crystal clear, celebrate your wins, but don't celebrate every win. That's one way that you can ensure that you're going to continue down the path of progress. And I think most of the learning tools that are in schools are about reward, hopefully for, for genuine performance. They are about encouraging us. We do have to believe that we can perform well. One of the hallmarks of growth mindset is the internalization that we're not getting it right yet. The word yet is very important. And also the sense that we reward our good, our good behavior, our, our good performance, but not every time. Reward is important. Self-reward is critically important. But make sure that you're not doing it on such a predictable schedule that you burn out these dopamine circuits or that you undercut your own ability to strive and achieve.
What's up is down, what's left is right Chasing stars and holding view I can't see the end, but we'll see it through Keep the sky on your mind 